Hello, I'm getting the name of the book saved, volume two, chapter four. Getting hungry. That's not the right place. By the time books, by the time books, Emma. Open, okay. There we go. Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Bree Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. Listeners like you. All of the links for our show are in the show notes. Today, we will be continuing Emma by Jane Austen. Austen. Chapter 4. Human nature is so well disposed towards those who are in interesting situations that a young person who either marries or dies is sure to be kindly spoken of. Spoken of. A week had not passed since Miss Hawkins' name was first mi- mm, I'll just spit. Spoken of. A week had not passed since Miss Hawkins' name was first mentioned in Highbury before she was, by some means or other, discovered to have every recommendation of person and mind. And mind. To be handsome, elegant, highly accomplished, and perfectly amiable. Be amiable. And when Mr. Elton himself arrived to triumph in his... Be amiable. And when Mr. Elton himself arrived to triumph in his happy prospects and circulate the fame of her merits... There was very little more for him to do, for him to do, than to tell her Christian name and say whose music she principally played. <clears throat> Excuse me. Principally played. Mr. Elton returned a very happy man. Happy man. He had gone away rejected and mortified, disappointed in a very sanguine hope after a series of what appeared to him strong encouragement. Encouragement. And not only losing the right lady but finding himself debased to the level of a very wrong one. A wrong one. He had gone away deeply offended. He came back engaged to another and to another as superior, of course, to the first. To the first. As under such circumstances, what is gained always is to what is lost. What is lost. He came back gay and self-satisfied, eager and busy, caring nothing for Miss Woodhouse and defying Miss Smith. Miss Smith. The charming Augusta Hawkins, in addition to all the usual advantages of perfect beauty and merit, was in possession of an independent fortune, independent fortune of so many thousands as would always be called ten, a point of some dignity as well as some convenience. convenience. A story told well, he had not thrown himself away. He had gained a woman of ten thousand pounds, or thereabouts. thereabouts. And he had gained her with such delightful rapidity, the first hour of introduction had been so very soon followed by distinguishing notice. Notice. The history of which, where am I? My back itches, it's distracting me. Eh. Notice. The history which he had to give Mrs. Cole of the rise and progress of the affair was so glorious. Glorious. The step so quick from the accidental rencontre to the dinner at Mr. Green's and the party at Mrs. Brown's. Mrs. Brown's. Smiles and blushes rising in importance with conscientiousness and agitation richly scattered. He scattered. The lady had been so easily impressed, so sweetly disposed, had in short to use a most intelligible phrase. A phrase. Been so ready to have him that vanity and prudence were equally contented. There's a lot of M dashes in this book. I'm just saying. Be contented. He had caught both substance and shadow, both fortune and affection, and was just the happy man he ought to be. He ought to be. Talking only of himself and his own concerns, expecting to be congratulated, ready to be laughed at. Be laughed at. And with cordial, fearless smiles, now addressing all the young ladies of the place to whom, a few weeks ago, he would have been more cautiously gallant. Gallant. The wedding was no distant event, as the parties had only themselves to please and nothing but the necessary preparations to wait for. To wait for. And when he set out for Bath again, there was a general expectation with a certain glance of Mrs. Cole's did not seem to contradict which. To wait for. And when he set out for Bath again, there was a general expectation which a certain glance of Mrs. Cole's did not seem to contradict that when he entered... 
contradict that when he next entered Highbury, he would bring his bride. Mm -hmm. God, it's taking forever to cool down. His bride. During his present short stay, Emma had barely seen him. Barely seen him. But just enough to feel that the first meeting was over and to give her the impression of his not being improved by the mixture of pique and pretension now spread over his air. For his air. She was, in fact, beginning very much to wonder that she had ever thought him pleasing at all. Pleasing at all. And his sight was so inseparably connected with some very disagreeable feelings that except in a moral light, as a penance, a lesson, a source of profitable humiliation to her own mind, her own mind. she would have been thankful to be assured of never seeing him again. See him again. She wished him very well, but he gave her pain, and his welfare twenty miles off would administer most satisfaction. Satisfaction. The pain of his continued residence in Highbury, however, must certainly be lessened by his marriage. His marriage. Many vain solicitudes would be prevented. Many awkwardnesses smoothed by it. Smoothed by it. A Mrs. Elton would be an excuse for any change of intercourse. Former intimacy might sink without remark. It would be almost beginning their life of civility again. Civility again. Of the lady, individually, Emma thought very little. Very little. She was good enough for Mr. Elton, no doubt, accomplished enough for Highbury. Handsome enough to look plain, probably by Harriet's side. Harriet's side. As to connection, there Emma was perfectly easy, persuaded that after all his own vaulted claims and disdain of Harriet, he had done nothing. Done nothing. On that article, truth seemed attainable. Seemed attainable. What she was must be uncertain, but who she was might be found out, and setting aside the ten thousand pounds, it did not appear that she was at all Harriet's superior. Superior. She brought no name, no blood, no alliance. Alliance. Miss Hawkins was the youngest of two daughters of a Bristol. Merchant, of course, he must be called. Must be called. But, as the whole of the profits of his mercantile life appeared so very moderate, it was not unfair to guess the dignity of his line of trade had been very moderate also. It also. Part of every winter she had been used to spend in Bath. Used. It also. Part of every winter she had been used to spend in Bath. But Bristol was her home, the very heart of Bristol. Heart of Bristol. For though the father and mother had died some years ago, an uncle had remained. In the law line, nothing more distinctly honorable was hazarded of him than that he was in the law line. The law line. And with him, the daughter had lived. Or had lived. Emma guessed him to be the drudge of some attorney and too stupid to rise. To rise. And all the grandeur of the connection seemed dependent on the elder sister, who was very well married to a gentleman in a great way near Bristol who kept two carriages. Carriages. That was the wind-up of the history. That was the glory of Miss Hawkins. It's the same spot, keeps itching. Hawkins. Could she but have given Harriet her feelings about it all? It's about it all. She had talked her into love. But alas, she was not so easily to be talked out of it. Talked out of it. The charm of an object to occupy the many vacancies of Harriet's mind was not to be talked away. Talked away. He might be superseded by another. He certainly would indeed. Nothing could be clearer. Even a Robert Martin would have been sufficient. But nothing else she feared would cure her. Would cure her. Harriet was one of those who, having once begun, would always be in love. Be in love. And now, poor girl, she was considerably worse from this reappearance of Mr. Elton. Mr. Elton. She was always having a glimpse of him somewhere or other. Somewhere or other. Emma saw him only once, but two or three times every day, Harriet was just... Mm. Somewhere or other. Emma saw him only once, but two or three times every day, Harriet was sure just to meet with him or just to miss him, just to hear his voice or see his shoulder. His shoulder. Just to have something occur to preserve him in her fancy, in all the favoring warmth of surprise and conjecture. Conjecture. She was, moreover, perpetually hearing about him. Hearing about him. 
for accepting Lynette Hartfield, she was always among those who saw no fault in Mr. Elton and found nothing so interesting as the discussion of his concerns. Concerns. And every report, therefore, every guess, all that had already occurred, all that might occur in the arrangement of his affairs, his affairs, comprehending income, servants, and furniture, was continually in agitation around her. And around her. Her regard was receiving strength by invariable praise of him, and her regrets kept alive and feelings irritated by ceaseless repetitions of Miss Hawkins' happiness. Excuse me. Happiness. And continual observation of how much he seemed attached. His air as he walked by the house. The very sitting of his hat being all in proof of how much he was in love. He was in love. Had it been allowable entertainment... Had there been no pain to her friend or reproach to herself in the waverings of Harriet's mind, Emma would have been amused by its variations. variations. Sometimes Mr. Elton predominated, sometimes the Martins, and each was occasionally useful as a check to the other. Check to the other. Mr. Elton's engagement had been the cure of the agitation of meeting Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin. The unhappiness produced by the knowledge of that engagement had been a little put aside by Elizabeth Martin's calling at Mrs. Goddard's a few days afterwards. Afterwards. Harriet had not been at home, but a note had been prepared and left for her, written in the very style to touch. To touch. A small mixture of reproach. With a great deal of kindness, until Mr. Elton himself appeared, she had been much occupied by it. Occupied by it continually pondering over what could be done in return and wishing to do more than she dared to confess. Confess. But Mr. Elton, in person, had driven away all such cares. Such cares. While he stayed, the Martins were forgotten, and on the very morning of his setting off for Bath again, Emma, to dissipate some of the distress it occasioned, it occasioned. judged it best for her to return Elizabeth Martin's visit. Martin's visit. How that visit was to be acknowledged. What would be necessary and what might be safest had been a point of some doubtful consideration. Consideration. Absolute neglect of the mother and sisters when invited to come would be ingratitude. Ingratitude. It must not be. And yet the danger of a renewal of the acquaintance. Oh my gosh, my back. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's just like a hair or something tickling back there, but oof. Booty, this chair. Because you can't, um, there's very little options for adjusting. Acquaintance. After much thinking, she could determine on nothing better than Harriet's returning the visit. In the visit. But in a way that, if they had understanding, should convince them that it was to be only a formal acquaintance. I'm talking into it funny. She meant to take her in the carriage, leave her at the Abbey Mill while she drove a little further and call for her again so soon as to allow no time for insidious applications or dangerous recurrences of the past, of the past. and give the most decided proof of what degree of intimacy was chosen for the future. Oh, there it is. For the future. She could think of nothing better. And though there was something in it which her own heart could not approve, something of ingratitude, Merely glossed over. Glossed over. It must be done. Or what would become of Harriet? Let's see how many pages we got here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, I'm tired of recording. I'll do the other one tomorrow. Harriet. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. All of the links for our show are in the show notes. Show notes. We are part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you ever wondered what inspired your favorite classic novelists to write their stories, their stories, what was happening in their lives or the world at the time, check out Bite at a Time Books, Behind the Story, Tuesdays wherever you listen to podcasts. Podcasts. Again, my name is Bree Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow while we take the next bite of Emma.
excuse me. And so I missed yesterday recording, so I had, I'm trying to be good and actually get two episodes a day recorded. So I um, missed yesterday. So today I did three and tomorrow I'll do another three to get me caught back up. Anyway, that's it. Thanks guys.